We are a few seconds past the hour, so I think we will get started. Uh, thank you everyone for attending this webinar about uh, the emergence of grassroots net networks promoting open science. Uh, we are delighted to have this discussion today for an hour with representatives from a few different networks who, is, uh, who are doing a variety of things uh, to try to promote open science in their regional communities. And so the goal for this uh, particular webinar is to have a very open uh, discussion about how communities are trying to engage uh, and shift norms and practices for uh, the research communities that they serve and hopefully provide a breeding ground for some communication and collaboration among us uh, so that we can do this uh, better uh, and more efficiently and share the knowledge and practices that we are pursuing together. So I'll just make a few preparatory comments and then each group of, of our panelists will uh, share uh, some of the activities from their perspective and the things that they've been working on. Uh, you as uh, attendees can uh, have uh, chat uh, during the discussion in the chat window and it appears that John Tennant already got that started. Thanks, John. Uh, and there is also a Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen where if you'd like to ask questions uh, from different members of the uh, panel or for broader discussion, you're welcome to post those there at any time. Uh, while they are giving their remarks, uh, I will monitor those and try to provide uh, some stimulus for them uh, to respond to. And then after each of the uh, presenters finishes, uh, we will use those uh, Q&A questions to promote some more general discussion. Uh, so before we transition to them, let me just make a note that when we use the term open science, there's a lot of different communities that are doing a number of different related activities uh, that fall under that umbrella. Uh, sometimes open science is about transparency. Let's make the outcomes of research more available, open access. Let's make the data or the materials the code behind uh, that research more accessible, or let's make the process more available, showing that what people have planned in advance versus things that are discoveries after the fact. Sometimes open science refers to rigor. How is it that we can improve our research practices and make them more robust and accessible and reproducible uh, overall? And sometimes open science is referring to inclusivity. How is it that we can make the scientific community uh, contribution to science more available to everyone and change the kinds of models of how it is people can, get, can make contributions and get rewarded and acknowledged uh, for those contributions. So that diversity of activities that, that embody uh, open science is also diverse in the various grassroots communities in terms of how they're trying to engage uh, others in trying to improve research practices or align the values that we have for science with what the daily practice is and what's rewarded. Uh, so each of the communities that present today will give their own flavor of the things that they have been working on uh, to try to uh, do these, uh, promote some of these new practices. And what's been most exciting uh, over the last few years is that the emergence of many of these community networks, that really the open science movement is characterized much more by grassroots campaigns, researchers deciding that we can do better uh, than what the present practice is, and starting to work together to make those changes happen uh, in their local communities. But it's also clear that the challenges facing the open science community are difficult ones because they are culturally embedded. Uh, and so grassroots communities can leverage each other to more effectively change uh, the cultural practices that make it, make, provide constraints uh, for researchers to be more open or transparent or more inclusive uh, in their research. So our primary hope with this kind of communication is that we start to see that other communities are doing uh, some of this work and that we can each learn from each other uh, to try to maximize the quality and impact of that work. So I'll make one more note and that is that this is being recorded. Uh, it will be available afterwards. Uh, and so if you miss things uh, or if you wanna share this with others, uh, there will be a link for that at the end. Okay, so let's go ahead and transition right to uh, the uh, presenters uh, that will be talking about their communities today. Uh, the first one will be Anita Erland uh, from the Open Science Communities Utrecht. Uh, she represents uh, a variety of open science communities that have emerged in the Netherlands, 
uh, each uh, in a, a city-based format. And so she'll tell us more about the work that she and her communities have been doing. So Anita. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, let me see if I can share my screen with you all. Um. Doesn't seem to work, right? Or does it? Not yet, you're not sure. There it is, and I see me. <laughs> Wait, but this is not this is not the screen that I wanted to share. It's this one. Yes. There you go. Perfect. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, my name is Anita Irland. I'm an assistant professor at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Um, and I will br first briefly explain um, why we, um, Luke Brinkman and I, came up with the idea of an open science community and then talk about the different formats that we have in place. Um, so the whole open science movement was started by researchers who thought that we could accelerate scientific progress by making science more accessible, transparent, um, robust, and uh, inclusive. And policymakers reacted to that. Uh, and now you can see that there are uh, policies in place with respect to open science on a local, national, and international level. Um, but having policies in place will not automatically make people adopt open science practices. So that's why we thought if we wanna have large-scale adoption of open science practices, we need a grassroots initiative. So some people uh, who we, we will call the experts are already practicing open science and they form the so-called open science bubble. And then there's a large group of people that are not practicing open science yet, uh, but they are at least interested in the topic, interested in learning more about open science. Um, and in order for them to do so, they need to know um, what open science is uh, and how and why they should practice open science. And then there is a group of researchers that are more or less ignored when it comes to open science. Um, they either don't care uh, or are against open science. And those researchers will probably only adopt open science practices if they really have to. Um, and that's not the group of researchers that we focus on. We really try to focus on those that are interested in open science and are just outside of the bubble. Because for a large scale adoption of open science practices, it is important that we reach those people that are just outside of the bubble. So those are the target audience for our open science community. Um, we need researchers to want open science if we really want everybody to adopt these practices. Um, and that's why we came up with uh, a bottom-up platform for researchers with an interest in and researchers with knowledge with respect to open science. Um, so this displays that we need both experts uh, with respect to open science, but also those that are interested in. We really didn't want to create another group of experts that talk to each other and tell each other why open science is so great. Um, we really needed a group of people that are interested in open science and we needed them to learn from and hear from those researchers that are just one step uh, ahead of them. Uh, so that's why we focus on experts and those interested. And that's also why you can be part of the uh, open science community even if you have little or no knowledge with respect to open science yet. So we really want to be as inclusive uh, as possible. So then there's a couple of goals that we have um, for the open science community. First of all, we want to make open science more visible and accessible. There are lots of people working on open science, but you don't always know who they are and what they're working on. So making open science knowledge more visible and accessible is an important goal. Um, we also want to promote knowledge exchange. So those that 
that have experience uh, with respect to open science share their experience with those that are not uh, experienced yet. Um, we want to inspire and enable researchers to take the next small step. So don't expect them to go full blown open science um, within a day or so, but really help people to take the first uh, small step. And then what is also important is that we want the open science community to identify obstacles and a need for support so that we can inform policymakers what is needed, what their community needs to uh, adopt those policies. And to reach these goals, we have a couple of formats in place. Um, so the first thing that we did was we created a website um, that lists uh, who we are, what we do. Uh, it has an agenda and it also uh, nicely lists the members that we have. So right now we launched our community a little over a year ago and we right now have 160 members uh, across the university and from all different faculties. Uh, being a member uh, only mention of means that you are uh, on our website with your name uh, and there's an example here uh, of um, my membership uh, you can list open science expertise that you have uh, and that you can be contacted for by other community members so if you want to know something about let's say SIPs for example you can see here that you can contact me for that if I click on the the tag it will list all the other people that have the same expertise um, so that's yeah that's I think a very nice thing to make the community visible and to make open science knowledge um, more accessible then we have a monthly newsletter that we try to sign out every month uh, that lists all the activities that we had uh, we also try to um, highlight one of our members um, let's see we're active on social media so we do have a twitter account there's also uh, a podcast the road to open science that we do not create but that we um, host on our website and then the past year we um, organized six workshop and workshops and open science cafes so we every other month we had a workshop that was open to everybody it did not have to be a member uh, was also open if you did not um, work at the university and after each workshop there was an open science cafe which which basically means an informal discussion on open science topics and what we realized was that during our last uh, workshop we had those people that just took their first steps and tell them about it to share their experience with uh, others and that actually uh, worked very well. So you don't want to have an expert saying to everybody how they should do it. But if you have a person that is just one step ahead, uh, that that tends to uh, work well. And then we have a couple of new formats uh, that we want to launch uh, next year. So the first thing is stickers. People seem to love stickers. So we created our own stickers and people can post it on their door to actually make open science and the community more visible. And instead of hosting uh, workshops that are open to everybody, we came up with the idea of hosting half day symposia per faculty so that you can go more in depth um, in, uh, with respect to the open science issues that are particular to a specific research area. Um, and another thing that I'm really looking forward to is the member initiative. So we want to uh, highlight or stress the community feel um, by having our members initiate initiate whatever they want. So if they want to get a group of people together to discuss certain open science uh, uh, issues or to work on something, uh, organize a hackathon, for example, they can actually do that and we will uh, help them promote it and get a group of people together. Um, let's see. Yeah, and so as, as I said, we launched our community uh, a little over a year ago, and now there are seven other open science communities in place in the Netherlands uh, and more to come. We're still figuring uh, out how, trying to figure out how um, this national network 
should operate, but it's clear, at least to me, that if we join forces, um, a lot can be done. Okay. Well, thank you, Anita. That was very exciting to see the overview of it. Uh, one quick question before we transition uh, to the next session is you said you already have more than 160 faculty involved uh, in it. Uh, what has been the most effective way to actually grow that group of people that are signed on members? Yeah, good question. Um, we started out personally reaching people that we knew were interested in open science. And now we have those people reach out to the people that they know. So uh, I think it really helps if you do a one on one contact with people, just personal contact, uh, writing emails to people, drinking coffee with people. Um, it, it, yeah, it doesn't help if you say, hey, this is the community, feel free to become a member. That doesn't really help well. So you really need to put in a lot of effort to personally reach out to people. Yeah, that's great. So there's a lot, I think, of meat in the what it is you presented as the various strategies of making things visible, of having personal contact. And another one that really stuck out to me was really meeting researchers where they are. That idea of having a presenter that's one step ahead rather than way out here sort of talking idealistically of that's way too far. <laughs> uh, I can't do that. Uh, that uh, those seem like very interesting things uh, to unpack. So we'll surely return to that uh, in our group discussion. So thank you for that, uh, Anita. Uh, we will next uh, ha hear from Marcus Munafo and Laura Fortunato uh, from the UK Reproducibility Network, a uh, network that is coordinated uh, at the national scale, but has a lot of individual uh, sites that are involved in, in this uh, and will complement very nicely, I think, some of the things that, that Anita described. So Marcus and Laura, please. Marcus, you're still on mute too. There we go. Does that screen look all right to you? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so um, thanks for the invitation to speak today. I'm going to start by talking about the UK Reproducibility Network generally, and then Laura is going to talk a little bit more about how that is realized at a local level um, at her own institution of Oxford, uh, which is one of our more mature local networks. And in a moment, you'll see what I mean when I talk about a local network. So the, um, the reproducibility network that we've built up in the UK grew out of existing activity around meta research, open research, and um, our interest in the drivers and incentives that shape the behavior of researchers themselves. So our aims are to understand the factors that contribute to poor research reproducibility, provide or um, incentivize training and disseminate best practice, support and to test interventions to improve reproducibility and critically the point that Brian was alluding to ensure coordination with our stakeholders so we had an initial meeting in September 2018 where we brought together key stakeholders funders publishers and other organizations within the UK uh, and talked about the need for this kind of national coordination and since then we obtained some funding from those uh, research councils and other funders that were present at that meeting and used that to establish the network. And we now have local network leads, which are the grassroots peer led part of the network at I think currently 43 different UK institutions. And we're supported by a range of different stakeholders. At the moment, we have 25 different stakeholders that range from research funders, publishers, learned societies, and then other professional organizations um, and bodies within the UK principally that support that wider academic ecosystem. And the steering group of UKRN consists of myself, a psychologist, Laura Fortunato from Oxford, who's an anthropologist, Malcolm McLeod from the University of Edinburgh, who's a neurologist, Alexandra Collins from Imperial College, who's an ecologist, and Chris Chambers from Cardiff, who's a neuroscientist. So we have quite a broad representation of disciplines, and that's reflected in our funders as well. So we have support from the Medical Research Council and the Medical Trust, which are biomedical funders, but we also have support from the Economic and Social Research Council, NERC, which funds research in the natural and environmental sciences, the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So it's really quite broad in terms of 
of our ambition because our view is that whilst much of the interest in um, reproducibility has been in the, the broadly defined biomedical space, including in um, psychology, actually many of the issues transcend that. And there are some very interesting conversations to be had about what constitutes data sharing and indeed what constitutes data across different disciplines. So the network is structured like this. We have the steering group at the center which uh, provides coordination, but the primary structure is one of this network of local networks that are led by individual local network leads that are these grassroots peer-led self-organizing structures within different institutions. And they um, take on their own identities and set themselves up uh, in a way that best suits the needs of that particular local institution. And Lara will talk about the one that she set up at Oxford um, in a few moments. One of the initiatives that we have been, well, first of all, so that coordination of uh, the grassroots activity with the stakeholder group that we have, which comprises our funders and our publishers and, and those other organizations that I mentioned, is part of what I think uh, is potentially quite powerful about this structure because it allows us to create a direct connection between the researchers themselves and the organizations that shape the incentive structures that are relevant to the issues that we're interested in. So we've already had a number of cases of one of those stakeholders, for example, JISC that provides digital services to the UK higher education sector, uh, sending out a questionnaire to our local network leads in order to essentially sanity check some of the initiatives that they are in the process of developing to ensure that whatever they come up with is actually fit for purpose in terms of the researchers that will be impacted by that, that new initiative. And similarly, when we have ideas for how the, um, the funding system that we operate within, for example, could be improved, we can feed that directly back up from our local networks to uh, the stakeholder group. So that connection between the two, I think, is um, valuable and important. But the next step that we're taking, which we're just beginning to develop, is to try and bring in that middle part, which is the institutions themselves. So you have the grassroots of researchers on the ground, you have the stakeholders that are providing the incentives at the top level, but the organizations that hold much of the research culture and incentives in terms of things like hiring and promotion practices are the institutions themselves. So we're now in a process of recruiting institutions to formally join the network. And we have a number that have committed to doing so and are just working through their internal processes before they can sign that off. But what that entails is creating within one of these institutions where we have a local network, a senior role reporting to the senior management team um, with a title similar to academic lead for research improvement. Obviously individual universities may um, shape these in uh, ways that suit their own local structures. But Bristol has just created one of these roles and that is intended to sit between the grassroots and the stakeholder group and provide another point of contact with a part of the wider academic ecosystem, if you like, that is relevant to shaping incentives in the way that um, I would imagine we're all interested in. So that's the state that we are at the moment. We have uh, recently completed an, an exercise where we think about the kind of theory of change that underpins the work that we're trying to do. This figure represents that. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it illustrates that we're talking about a very complex and interconnected problem. And we can zoom in on different elements of that and think about how we can shape those different components through the activity of these grassroots networks, through uh, engagement with the various stakeholder groups, the sense that I have certainly within the UK is that there's a great deal of interest from many researchers, but also from many funders and publishers and others in improving the quality of the work that we do. But there's no one coordinating body that allows all of that to be essentially oriented in the same direction. And so part of our role, we think, is to help support that kind of coordination. And there are a range of different activities that we've engaged in in year one. Um, and we're moving into our second year uh, at the moment. We have a range of activities that, where we're working with stakeholders. So many of these you'll be familiar with, registered reports and registered reports, research grants or funding mechanisms, accountable replication policies at journals, editors for better research. So we have many journals that we're working with on adopting registered reports, for example, that's led by Chris Chambers, partnering journals and funders um, through these registered reports, research grants scheme, and you can see one of the pilots that's underway at the moment uh, between the journal nicotine and tobacco uh, research which is published by oup and cancer research uk a major funder in the uk and we have some funding from the welcome to evaluate 
that uh, pilot and feasibility study to determine whether or not it would be feasible to do a full trial of that, um, that model of combined funding and journal peer review. And then for researchers, for the grassroots networks, we're setting up open research working groups. We're supporting those networks to um, establish reproducibility journal clubs. We're working on a range of uh, short courses that will provide training in the broader skills around, for example, how to go about sharing data and what some of the issues are that may differ across different disciplines. We're working with institutions on their hiring and promotion practices to incentivize um, different open research practices. For example, through my role as academic lead for research improvement at Bristol, we recently included data sharing in our promotion criteria, and that's something that we're hoping to roll out across other institutions. And then we have other projects like um, consortium-based student projects led by Catherine Button at Bath, and we're developing a series of primers on open research practices, again, to allow us to reach out to that um, outside of that bubble that was mentioned earlier of researchers who are already engaged with these issues to those who might be interested in adopting these kinds of ways of working, but need some guidance on exactly how to do that. So that's where we got to, and it feels like we're at quite an exciting stage in terms of the, the sheer amount of interest that's being generated, both at the grassroots, but also at those higher levels as well. So at that point, I'll hand over to Lara. Okay, so I don't have any slides, but I'll be very happy to talk through uh, what we've been doing here in Oxford and how the local network interfaces with um, the broader UKY network that Marcus has just um, introduced. Um, so uh, the, the network uh, I uh, coordinate here with uh, many others um, is Reproducible Research Oxford. Um, it's an initiative that started in uh, 2016 uh, officially. Um, we applied for some funding from uh, university IT services. And the focus then was specifically on provided training in basic skills that researchers need to make the research more open and reproducible. Um, so uh, we did that specifically by uh, setting up a partnership with uh, the Carpentries, Software and Data Carpentries, which some of you may know are uh, community-based, uh, community-led uh, organizations uh, that uh, work to provide training in these um, areas. And uh, for the first couple of years, we effectively focused on providing that training. Uh, so we run uh, about uh, seven workshops, I think, here in Oxford, uh, tailored to anybody in the university from uh, undergraduate students all the way to senior professors, uh, technicians, anybody, librarians who might be interested in or uh, uh, involved in providing this sort of training or uh, applying these skills. Um, and these workshops were, were, were quite successful. I think we catered to upwards of uh, 200 uh, learners. Uh, the, the workshops were free. Um, they, were run, they were run by volunteers, instructors, um, and uh, that was the initial focus. Another side of that was also to train instructors based here in Oxford who could then uh, go back to their own departments, go back to their own, their own units within the university and provide training to their uh, colleagues. So we run um, two uh, instructor training events over the two years and those were quite successful and frankly oversubscribed. Uh, so to indicate that there is actually quite a lot of uh, demand in a university of this size. Um, um, now, uh, alongside this uh, initial effort, a number of different activities had developed. Uh, some run in different departments, some uh, run by um, early career researchers, for example, uh, spanning the whole range, the whole spectrum of, of things that have to do with open, open science and open research. And so with the creation of, of UKRN, of the UK Reproducibility Network that Marcus has just introduced, um, this seemed like a good opportunity for us to try and bring together all those efforts within the university um, and create one broader community. Um, because it seemed very important um, that we have a, sort of a one direction of travel, that we're all speaking to uh, administrators, for example, within the university and have one message and are trying to press um, particular points that we want to see. So effectively, the past year has focused on trying to get that uh, community together uh, and coordinated with the UKRN on the one hand, um, but also, and I think this is important for, our, for a network uh, at the stage that our network is at, 
uh, we've been uh, looking for opportunities uh, to fund um, somebody's time effectively to run some of the activities um, because of course everybody uh, is heavily involved in this activity but we're all doing it on a sort of goodwill basis and um, of course that's a limited resource <laughs> and also it's 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 um, uh, it's not uh, necessarily uh, effectively used um, uh, over the long run um, so uh, we've been uh, applying for funding uh, from the university um, and that's been uh, a core focus of our activity over the past few years um, in a university of this size, so here in Oxford, um, we do have different uh, pots of funding available, uh, and this may vary, uh, of course, across institutions depending on 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 and size. Uh, but I I think the the one thing that uh, uh, we've learned is that it pays to be creative, um, because different um, units within the university might be interested in this and might be available um, to uh, to fund bits of of the puzzle um, so that's where at, where we're at uh, in terms of uh, of sustaining the network for the long long term really um, in terms of activities i mentioned the workshop that we've been running uh, we are um, uh, planning a summer school uh, which ran already uh, last year so this will be run in, in september this year in a partnership with uh, berlin um, uh, there is a very successful uh, uh, journal club that has been uh, hosted by Sam Parsons and Amy Auburn um, in uh, psychology, which is aimed at early career researchers, and that's been going uh, for uh, about a year now, I guess, the Reproducibility Journal Club. So there are many different initiatives that um, have been happening in Oxford, and really uh, the focus now is to try and, and coordinate all of that energy and channeling it into one uh, direction of trouble. And I guess one final point I would make is that our focus uh, here has been uh, to try and, and build as inclusive a community as possible in terms of disciplines. Um, so Marcus mentioned I'm an anthropologist, uh, I'm an evolutionary anthropologist. Uh, so here in Oxford I sit in the um, social science um, division. And um, so perhaps not the most obvious target for uh, open research uh, initiatives. Um, with that in mind, uh, the, the lesson that we've learned from this is that there is a lot that we can learn from other communities and how they interpret open science and the problems around open science. Uh, and so really, um, that has been a really uh, interesting and important uh, 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 focus of our efforts to try and bring different disciplines together across uh, all areas of study. So not just the pod sciences. So we, we tend to use the, the label open research for that reason, to involve, for example, people in the humanities. So. Excellent. Laura, Marcus, thank you for that. It's incredibly impressive, the scope of things that uh, you have organized uh, locally and nationally uh, with this work. Uh, one of the most, and there's a lot of things to talk about with it, but one of the most important things it seems to me uh, that the network really provides is that through way of communication between the stakeholder groups and the individual communities. It can be in a lot of these grassroots efforts that at the local level, it can feel like it's just fighting a fight that can't be won because, because who can change the culture uh, at that scale? Uh, and so, yeah, we're training, we're learning, we're getting all these activities, but what's going to happen? And then even among stakeholder groups of curious observation, and my experience has been they feel very divorced from the realities of the everyday researcher and don't know what to change or how to change it because they don't know what impact it will have uh, on people on the ground. So I wonder if you can briefly, before we transition to Alexander, say a little bit about how you were able to get started in getting that uh, network of stakeholders together and is it now just sort of self-sustaining that they see the value of this connection or are there things that you need to do to cultivate that? Um, I mean it took a long time to, to get everyone in the room. Um, once we managed to get everyone in the room then there was a huge amount of enthusiasm for what we were proposing. I think I just spent maybe five years cultivating networks not just myself but people like Lara and Chris and and others. Um, making connections with the relevant stakeholders, with the publishers, with the funders. We each had 
different connections, if you like, and we were able to leverage those to, to get them in the room. But we were also able to capitalize on um, serendipity because the Science and Technology Committee of our government um, held an inquiry into research integrity um, last year. And whilst the focus of that was primarily research fraud, they did also touch on reproducibility. And that focused the minds of the funders in particular, but also the institutions. And so there was a, a sort of almost teachable moment that we could use to, to get them in the room. And once they were in the room and, and they could see just how much need there was for coordination amongst themselves, um, then they were very enthusiastic to support us. Uh, we're, we're at a sensitive point at the moment because they funded us in most cases for the first year and they want to see what we've done with their money in the first year. Um, I think we have a pretty good return to show them on that investment, but um, it will be moving from the model that we have at the moment, which is lots of small pots of funding from individual funders through to something that's more sustainable, that will be the next key transition. But I'll just pick up on something else you said. I think it's really true that um, that there's a need at both of those levels, the grassroots level and the stakeholder level for that connection. And at our meeting in March, one of the powerful things was that we, we had a meeting in the morning with our local networks and a meeting in the afternoon with our stakeholders. And at, at the middle of the day over lunch, they were able to, to mingle and interact. And we ended up with one of our early career researchers who leads one of our local networks, sat next to the editor in chief of Nature, talking about reproducibility issues. And they exchanged email addresses and have been in touch since, and both of them, you know found it to be a valuable interaction um so i think one of the things that we're really keen to do is to um allow people to develop those relationships and to interact with each other and also to promote initiatives that just seem like you know good initiatives that are valuable to the community we've talked about a few of those but those are really not ones that we've generated ourselves so reproducibility for example as lara mentioned originated from a group of early career researchers in um in Oxford, uh, Amy Auburn, Sam Parsons, and Sophia Krull. And it's still very much their project. We're just providing a bit of support to be able to, you know, buy teapots and send those out to our local networks and so on to, to just enhance what they're already doing. That's excellent. Yeah, you could just really see how once these th networks are established, they just keep to feeding each other like that. That was a perfect illustration of that. Uh, there's lots more to unpack there. Uh, listeners, if you have questions that you want to make sure the panelists uh, address afterwards, uh, please do uh, drop them into Q&A. I see that there are a couple of there already. Uh, but we'll get uh, Alexander uh, to present about how BITS is working, uh, and then we'll open up for a broader discussion. So Alexander Bogdanowski uh, from BITS, you're up. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning from Berkeley. Uh, thanks to you, Brian, and your colleagues at uh, the Center for Open Science for putting this together. Um, let me start off with uh, t by, by telling you m a bit more about what BITS is and a little bit about our origin story. So BITS is an initiative of the Center for Effective Global Action, which is a UC Berkeley-based research hub which focuses on international development. Uh, we've been around since 2012. Uh, practically, we were established by a group of researchers from across the social sciences, I think including you, you Brian, uh, who got together at, at, at Berkeley to discuss the use of pre-analysis plans and, and study registries. So the idea back then was to sort of facilitate exchange of ideas and best practices across the social sciences, given that um, researchers uh, across these disciplines face similar challenges and respond to similar incentive structure. And then this sort of interdisciplinary and facilitating approach has been at the core of what we do ever since. Uh, in a nutshell, what we do is uh, we work to advance the rigor, ethics, transparency, and reproducibility of social science. And we see this as means of improving its credibility. Uh, we interact with not only researchers, but then also uh, funders, uh, research institutions, journals. And as I said, uh, when, in our interactions, we mostly act as facilitators, namely by convening them and uh, facilitating uh, consensus and, and uh, network building, and also by empowering, empowering them to push for change within their environment. We're a relatively small team, uh, we only have 
uh, we're essentially a team of four uh, with uh, two scholars, namely our faculty director, Ted McGill, and uh, Fernanda Hostas de la Guardia, who's our project scientist, and two program staff, uh, Katie Horberling, uh, our program manager, and myself. However, we, we do get a lot of support from our 13 member advisory board uh, and our colleagues at CEO. So what we do has evolved over time, but our activities mainly fall under three general lines of work. So uh, first of all, we conduct and support meta research. Uh, so this is including uh, research projects on factors that contribute to poor reproducibility, but then also research that develops and evaluates the effectiveness of solutions such as tools and practices for, for open science. Um, we conduct training, uh, and then a large part of this, or a large part of our work in this regard is, our, uh, is based on, our, on the work of our catalysts, where uh, essentially our network, uh, and these are graduate students, academic faculty, and other researchers who teach and advocate for open science. I'm gonna talk a bit more about them later. And then finally, an increasing part of our work is our work with journals, institutions, donors, uh, where we help them develop and implement policies and, and protocols to support open science. So just to give you a general idea of our, the scope of our work, here are some numbers from our work over the last three years. So, our network consists of 137 individuals who are based at 100 different institutions, so across the world and 33 different countries. Uh, over the last three years, our network and through our tra through trainings that we've organized on our own and through our uh, MOOC that I'm going to talk about also later, we've reached out to roughly 4,500 researchers. Uh, our research portfolio consists of 32 different meta science research projects. Um, and then in the last three years, three to four years, we've allocated, we've competitively allocated $760,000 to support research and training uh, activities led by our network. So let me delve, delve a little bit deeper into each of these three buckets. So in terms of how we support research, uh, SMART has been our uh, flagship program, or that stands for Social Science, Meta Analysis, and Research Transparency Grants. Uh, through this funding scheme, we've allocated roughly six, $600,000 uh, between 2015 and 2017 to 22 different research projects. And then these span from um, all of, they span all over uh, what, we, what we now know as, as meta science. So from research on researcher and publisher practices, such as investigation of publication bias in economics journals or the misuse of covariates to achieve statistical significance in political science, uh, to evaluation uh, of tools and methods, such as uh, an evaluation of the effectiveness of pre-analysis plans uh, or data use agreements to facilitate data sharing for meta analysis. And then some of them are uh, field and topic specific meta analysis or systematic reviews. All of them, uh, you, can, you can learn about all of them on our website. And then um, some, a lot of them are, have also been published uh, on Meta Archive, which is the preprint service that we run. So in addition to supporting research, uh, we also conduct research. And by we, I mean mostly Ted and Fernando. Uh, I want to highlight an, a current or uh, a recent uh, project, which is the bit state of this of social science study or the 3S study, which is like we like to say the first representative longitudinal survey of researcher norms and practices across the social sciences. Uh, an early, though this is an still work in progress, an early insight is uh, has provided some good news for the open science movement. Suggesting that uh, over the last decade, there has been a rapid expansion of the use of open science practices, accounting for uh, sharing data, uh, study instruments, and pre-registering. 
So based on the responses that we, that we got uh, from our sample, uh, we learned that over 80% of scholars have used at least one of these practices, which has been a rapid increase from uh, less than a quarter of a decade earlier. Another uh, interesting, uh, another related project in this line of work is our upcoming forecasting and initiative uh, where we work with uh, Stefano Della Vigna and Eva Vival. And as part of this project, we will build a platform to systematically collect, collect prior. So this is gonna be sort of a public resource. And then we're gonna test the platform uh, through a dozen, half a dozen pilot projects and hopefully we'll, that will help us generate insights on how to improve the accuracy of forecasts in general. And then finally, though this is not an actual research output, this is a repository. Uh, we run a meta archive, uh, which is, we hope, or we hope that it will become the go-to repository for research in meta science. Uh, so far we have only published uh, 61 preprints. So any one of you who are doing meta science, I, I, I encourage you to consider posting your, your, your work on this, this preprint service. In terms of our capacity building efforts, uh, our sort of flagship program is uh, a, a research transparency reproducibility training or RT2, which is a three day workshop on pretty much all aspects of research transparency and reproducibility. So from um, understanding the drivers of, of, of the reproducibility crisis through uh, various tools and practices um, for improved trans transparency and reproducibility, such as pre analysis plans, uh, pre registration, uh, data sharing, etc. We've organized seven of these so far, uh, including a few international ones in London and Amsterdam. And I'd like to use this opportunity to advertise our upcoming one in Washington, D.C., which is going to take place between uh, September 11th and 13th. And we're still accepting applications for this one. Uh, in terms of how we support our network to, to, do, to, to, build, to, to train others uh, on, on how to do open science, I mentioned the bulk of this is done through our Catalyst network. Uh, catalysts are researchers who teach and advocate for open science and uh, we've, we're, we're very proud of their work. Um, they, they work all over the, all over the world and uh, so far they've, they've trained around 1,500 uh, 1, researchers including uh, 950 in uh, lower and middle income countries. So this sort of stems from the mandate of our host and it, uh, organization, the Center for Effective Global Action, which, which puts a lot of emphasis on, on uh, including scholars from, 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 from these parts of the world. Then we also run our uh, five week long BitSmook uh, on the Future Learn platform, and, but however, it's also available on our website right now. And then finally, we curate a, a growing repository with uh, over 100 teaching materials, templates, software tools as part of our resource library. So uh, if, you, if you're not sure where, if you like to practice open science uh, and you're not sure where to start, I, I, I highly encourage you to check this resource out. And then if you yourself have uh, some tools and, practice, and, 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 uh, and, 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 and templates and other resources that you would like to see there, please reach out to me and uh, so that we can have them included in our library. And then a very interesting uh, development, uh, a very interesting piece of news from what is our recent, recently published textbook, which came out just last week. So uh, Transparent and Reproducible Social Science by Greg Christensen, who's at the US Census Bureau and formerly at BITS, uh, by Jeremy Fries at Stanford University and our faculty director, Ted Miguel. Uh, it's available to purchase for purchase uh, from UC Press. Uh, unfortunately, we, we're not able to uh, provide an, an an open access copy. However, we are trying to uh, facilitate a broaden access to the to as much as possible. So, uh, if you yourself are are teaching uh, a 
a, a course in in in, in, in the social sciences and, and you, you would like to consider integrating a, a, a transparency and reproducibility as, as a module, uh, I encourage you to email me. Uh, I provided my email address right there and uh, ask for a free copy. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned, an increasing part of what we do is our collaborating with uh, researchers, uh, with, with uh, journals, donors, and other research institutions. Uh, to help them develop policies and protocols to re recognize and foster uh, transparency and reproducibility. So this stems from the understanding that research is conducted as a part of a larger ecosystem in which funding, collaboration, and career incentives also play an important role. So some of the, are some of the projects that I would like to highlight are our collaboration with the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, from earlier this year where we worked with research managers at the institution to help them develop uh, SOPs for uh, to practically integrate transparency and reproducibility tools and practices in all research supported by the bank. Uh, another interesting project is our uh, pilot of register reports with the Journal of Development Economics, which uh, from what we know is was the first effort to introduce this format in, in, um, in, in economics. It's been largely successful uh, with over 45 submissions so far, six in principal acceptances as of right now. And uh, the JD has also decided to maintain this, this, uh, this track as a, on a permanent basis. Um, another project that we, that we work uh, in terms of institutionalizing transparency is our work on open policy analysis, which is an approach to policy analysis where Data, code, materials, and uh, accounts of methodological decisions are made freely available to, in a way to uh, help out with collaboration, discussion, and reuse. Um, it's essentially an application of open science tools and principles in a completely new realm. Um, and in this regard, we work with research and uh, with policy analysts to help them either develop uh, open policy and OPA uh, compliant uh, versions of their policy reports or to incorporate tools and practices into their regular workflow. So um, as, a, as, a recent, as, a, as a recent instance of, of our work in this, in this regard, I would like to point out a recent case study that we did with uh, Berkeley economists Emmanuel Saez and Gabriel Zuckman, uh, where we reproduce a fully reproducible, where we help them produce a fully reproducible version of their analysis, uh, which is the basis of uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren's progressive wealth tax and part of her 2020 uh, research, uh, presidential campaign. And then finally, um, in an upcoming partnership, we're, we're going to work with the AEA. Uh, particularly with uh, the AA data editor, where we'll develop curriculum and uh, deliver trainings to support their recently updated data and co policy, which uh, mandates uh, pre publication verification of computational reproducibility. So, uh, in addition to uh, curriculum and training, uh, we're also going to develop a, a, a platform to catalog all uh, crowdsource replications and results from all over economics. So uh, if you yourself are, are interested in this, particularly if you're interested in replication in economics, stay tuned for more updates. And finally, uh, I encourage you to keep in touch. Uh, here's some my, my contact information. Uh, and then make sure to subscribe to our monthly newsletter and then follow our blog. Also reach out if, reach out if you have any ideas on on uh, and, and you're interested in, in authoring a blog post. Excellent, thank you, Alex. That was a fabulous overview, and you really captured their multiple dimensions at which Bits is operating. And it seems that they have some connectivity among them: the the research work, the training work, and the social initiatives. Uh, that'll be great to unpack in in some Q and A time if we can. I want to be mindful of time, and we do have a list of questions that uh, yep. people have raised. Uh, I'm going to suggest we go to 10 minutes past the hour, and if people need to go, they can go, but I'll, I'll launch into some of these questions so that we can get through as many of them 
uh, as we can. And, and I'll start one, with one, Alex, that came uh, while you were speaking that I think is part of the, the training and the early thing that you said. Emily Farron asks, how do you test best practices? How do you know what it is that you want to uh, get people to do and evaluate whether it's working? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, well, I guess part of our, our, our uh, training agenda is informed by uh, meta research. So we... We, we like to say that we're in, in very much in tune with uh, what we've learned from, from, from uh, research evaluating these tools and practices. Uh, and however, we're also listening to our faculty for R2 faculty who they themselves are experienced researchers and, and, and can speak a great deal about what has worked and hasn't from their own experience. So in, in, a, in a short, that, that, that could be the shortest answer I can give you. Yeah, yeah, this is complex, right? Because a lot yeah. of these, we have good theory for why it is these are the right way to do things. And right. the evidence base is still, you, we need to actually do it in order to accumulate that evidence base. That's great. Right. right. Uh, so Jason Colancherry has a question that I'll read in full. And I think it probably, uh, Laura and Anita might be the, best place to start with an answer and then everybody from the panel can address. And that is, what advice do you have for PhD students who are interested in following open science practices and implement measures to prevent reproducibility issues, but do not have the necessary support and sometimes active resistance from PIs and others? How is it that these communities might be able to help with some of that? Should I go first? Um, say. Uh, what, what we've observed here in Oxford is that there are communities of uh, early career researchers, so other PhD students, maybe not in your department, uh, maybe um, in a different uh, research group in the same department or in a different department. And those can be very effective uh, groups for uh, PhD students to adopt and learn from uh, sort of horizontally from other uh, PhD students. Um, so, um, uh, this may be especially useful for um, people who might feel isolated within the research group because nobody else is interested or maybe the PI is not particularly supportive. Um, so seek out people uh, in, the, in the department or in the broader institution who can uh, help you um, uh, learn some of these techniques. Also, um, of course, if there are networks like uh, we have here in Oxford or the, or the um, open science uh, groups that Anita has talked about in the Netherlands, of course, those are great resources. It goes without saying. Um, uh, but then look up also, uh, for example, the Carpentries. Uh, they have free workshops that you may be able to attend um, uh, uh, and that may provide a, an initial uh, um, uh, road into some of these uh, techniques. Yeah, I was also going to say try to seek support, um, maybe not within your institution, but beyond. Um, there are lots of PhD students that probably struggle or struggled with the same issues, and I think it's very important that you see that you're not the only one and that you can learn from the experiences from others. So others that had PIs that were not supportive of open science, for example. Um, yeah, so I think yeah, that's important, especially if you don't feel that there's support within your institution. Alex, did you have something you want to say there too? Yeah, I just want to corroborate what, what Anita and Laura said. Uh, yeah, make sure to join a, a community of practice and. Uh, Sometimes what we've learned from, from our interaction with, with Catalyst, just having some sort of a, a, a network or institutional support can go a long way. So uh, even, even just, just like a, a simple uh, letter of support that we, for example, have, have given to our Catalyst have helped, helped them a great deal. And uh, yeah, just try it. Try, try to join a network uh, and uh, seek for, for whatever support that you can get. That's great. Thanks. That actually leads to uh, another question that Crystal Stellenpol uh, asked, and maybe uh, Marcus might start uh, on responding to this. 
She says, I'm curious if the panelists have thoughts about how people at low resourced institutions or areas might get involved with open science initiatives. The examples that we have today are from places that have a lot of resources. And in fact, that sounds like it's been a key part uh, for some of these uh, come to, coming together well. Uh, what is it that people can do to leverage some of these networks or to start them themselves without that same kind of resources? Uh, Marcus or others? Well, the first thing I'd say is that for many of the things that we're talking about, you don't necessarily need um, a huge amount of resource. So, for example, journal clubs uh, principally require time more than anything else. Um, but then I think another level to that answer is that these networks are there to provide that sense of community for those who otherwise might feel relatively isolated. So the fact that there is a, um, a group of uh, individuals across a country or a region or a discipline that um, are engaging with the same issues provides you with that wider support structure. Uh, one of the things that we've done through UKRN, for example, is to set up a Slack channel for our local network leads so that they have a means of communicating regularly with each other. We also send out starter packs for those who want to set up reproducibility journal clubs. Um, but then another reason for having that connection between the grassroots and the institutions and the other stakeholders at a higher level is that it um, identifies those needs that individual researchers or groups of researchers have that we can then use to advocate for a provision of that resource, either by institutions or by um, stakeholders at a higher level. So for example, JISC in the UK is a digital services provider and they're interested in things like how they can provide the infrastructure to enable things like data sharing more readily across a wider range of institutions. So I think to some extent um, you do whatever you can do locally but you try to make yourself part of this um, wider network and, and there are so many of them now as we've been talking about that there's almost certainly going to be one that you can connect with that then provides you with that next level of support. Great, any others want to comment on that as well? Okay, great, thank you, excellent. Uh, so uh, uh, perhaps related to the sort of the joint nature of the two themes that just the last two questions, Sao Chin Chen asks, some open practices are unwelcome in countries outside of North America and the EU, although that may be overestimated how welcome they are <laughs> within those domains too. Uh, for example, public preprints, open peer review. So he, asking what advice would you offer to change minds in societies or locations where there's still a lot of resistance or a lot of a lack of information? And Anita, you had raised some of this in your characterization, even within the institutions that you're engaging. Uh, of some people are actively opposed or not engaged and others are more interested. How do you think about this on a cultural scale? Well, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, I think when it comes to preprints, for example, um, I don't see why you could not upload your work as a preprint in addition to do whatever is uh, expected from you. Um, I do think that it's hard if, if the culture is such that open science practices are not supported at all. Um, and to be honest, I'm not really sure how you can actually change that. I think that even in uh, North America and in Europe, uh, a culture change is needed uh, so that we are going to reward uh, open science practices. Um, and that's something that is very hard to influence. So I think I would try to do as much as you can and want to do, uh, even though it's not supported without doing the stuff that gets rewarded and is supported, if that makes sense. Yeah, do others, that's great. Uh, do others have comments on onboarding the reluctant or the skeptical uh, and experiences that happen locally uh, or more broadly? Uh, sometimes I think the the barrier to entry is simply uh, not knowing. So I would encourage en encourage whoever is in such a position to sort of share some some resources and and try to take the lead uh, when when they they work with, for example, like senior faculty who are reluctant or resistant to such practices. So luckily, there are there is a wealth of resources. 
pretty much for any discipline for for any use and uh i'll i would encourage them to sort of take advantage of that and uh help their colleagues help their peers uh, overcome this this barrier of entry great thank you alex uh, I'm going to have uh, one more uh, general question from um, Amelia Zine uh, that each of you can answer, uh, and then I'll just do a couple quick closing comments about next steps uh, for this. Uh, and she asks, what is the biggest obstacle that you've had to deal with uh, in managing your initiative, uh, and what are some things that are either you've done to overcome them or are still working on uh, to try to address that? What makes this work and what are the barriers? Maybe Marcus, we can start with you and everybody can uh, provide an answer. So the biggest challenge personally, and I think um, Laura alluded to this as well, is just bandwidth. You know, I have to keep my own day job ticking over in the background doing my primary research and then um, keeping all of these plates spinning. One of the things that the funding that we've been given has um, allowed us to do is to appoint an administrator that just takes a little bit of that pressure off people like myself and Laura and, um, and Chris and so on. Um, but then I think that also needs to happen at the local level. So one of the reasons why we're trying to get institutions on board is that they will then start to fund this activity locally, provide the infrastructure to allow those local networks to grow, to allow the senior roles to uh, become embedded and so on. Um, as with many things, the biggest obstacle is just time. Anita. Yeah, for us, uh, it was funding, so money uh, that also comes down to time. Uh, everything that we did in the first year, we did in our own time uh, without any funding. Um, and we have overcome this obstacle. Uh, I think uh, almost a year in our uh, initiative, um, I think the university saw that we were actually doing something, that we were actually able to reach out to researchers to get their feedback and to uh, inform uh, them about open science practices and that we could also help them to give feedback from the researchers uh, on their policies uh, and, and let them know what um, support was needed. So I think um, in the beginning they didn't want to support us, uh, which makes sense because, well, we had to prove ourselves. Um, but after we did, um, they were actually very happy in helping us getting getting funding because they saw that uh, what we did was important and that they actually needed us as well. Excellent, thank you. Laura? I think time and, and, and funding, uh, and of course the two intersect to the extent that you're applying for funding to uh, make time for the activities. Um, so uh, obviously we're very um, lucky here in the sense that, as I said, there are different pots of funding um, that are available. Um, um, so I think that's been, I wouldn't necessarily an obstacle, but uh, something that has um, possibly slowed us down in the sense of a lot of energy and a lot of goodwill and we want to do a lot of things, uh, but we have to be realistic and manage what, what we take on. Um, so I think that's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's an obstacle, but that's just the reality of, of doing this uh, on a volunteer basis. Um, uh, uh, and, and as Marcus uh, alluded, you sort of have to uh, pace yourself to make sure you don't, don't burn and crash <laughs> uh, early on. Yeah, great. And Alex? Uh, I guess also funding. <laughs> What's new? Uh, I... I realize that what we do is, is very niche and there's not a lot of funding opportunities uh, specifically in, intended for open science or just personal disability. And we've overcome to this by being very entrepreneurial, very creative, uh, very flexible in terms of uh, the things that we work on and, and the partners that we seek out. But then, uh, I mean, a, a, a huge part of our of our time in the in the last year, particularly, has been dedicated to just like fundraising and being part of a of, of a larger center, such as the Center for Effective Global Action, which has a lot of uh, program staff on board. We've we've had the luxury to do this, and we've received a lot of support. So, um, yeah. 
Yeah. So, thank, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for those uh, responses. Uh, and what's clear from from the range of them is that grassroots communities can have a lot of energy, a lot of motivation, get a lot done. But the, that pro challenge of sustainability: how do we make this something that is an institutionalized uh, and pervasive and ongoing solution? Is a real barrier. Uh, and is going to continue to be. We're not going to escape that easily or quickly among us. Uh, so given uh, the time, let me just close uh, this session first by just thanking our panelists for making time and sharing the amazing work uh, that their communities have done and hope that that uh, provides some good context uh, for the listeners about things that they might be able to do and draw from. Uh, likewise, the participants, question, there are more questions in the Q&A, uh, you can, and I see people are already answering each other. Uh, that is great. Uh, please continue to do that. And I just want to uh, close with a couple of next steps so that this isn't just a conversation uh, that ends and goes nowhere else. Uh, and so the, the things to point out are, are first, that this conversation among a few networks is the start of a potentially much better set of communication and coordination. A lot of what came up uh, in everybody's uh, comments uh, about their networks uh, locally and regionally was about the role of convening of communication, of having information exchanges so that people could be more effective, more efficient, and use what little resources are available as far as they can go. Uh, and so there is a, a Google spreadsheet that people have been crowdsourcing, just populating with the networks that they know about. Uh, that networks list is there at the short URL, BFCZ4. Uh, you can go there and find networks that might be relevant to you or add one that isn't uh, there so that there can be more information about who is out there uh, that can be communicating and coordinating. There's also now a Google group uh, for discussion among network of networks uh, and this short, this next short URL, that's rbgi7, not 17. Uh, and you can join that and see what other networks are doing and have a place uh, to be able to communicate about common challenges or solutions. And the last thing that I want to mention is that we have the preliminary uh, work done on an NSF proposal uh, for a mechanism that NSF uh, supports networks of networks uh, to try to help facilitate exactly the challenges that we are uh, discussing here as a group. There are some challenges of NSF's funding in terms of where it can be uh, spent, uh, particularly uh, it is US centric, uh, but they are trying to enable global networks. So we're going to try to push the boundaries uh, of that as far as uh, that mechanism will go. Uh, we will be reaching out to everybody that's on that Google discussion group and networks list to potentially be involved in that. Uh, if you aren't on either of those, but you have a network, uh, please get on that or uh, email me to say you are a network and you want to be part of that. Uh, and we will be sending out uh, information uh, shortly about that. Uh, and then lastly, if you got something out of this as a discussion, uh, one of the things that we are trying to help do is continue to facilitate these kinds of open discussions for the global uh, community. And so the uh, address there, cos.io webinars, uh, is where the upcoming webinars are scheduled. Uh, and the next one uh, is listed there, advocating for change in how science is conducted uh, to level the playing field. And this will be particularly focused on some of the themes that came up today about incentives uh, and culture change and how do we shift those uh, across the various stakeholder groups uh, in the research community. So with that, uh, we will close this uh, webinar and thank everyone uh, for their questions, their participation, and for all of the work uh, that they're doing to try to advance uh, the progress in open science uh, in all of its dimensions. So thank you very much.